Good morning, everyone. My name is Marvin Lyman. I am the director of the CARES Act Assistance Program for the Denver CARES Act Center. We work in conjunction with the Denver Minority Business Development Agency, also known as the Denver MBDA, and we work with the Minority M Mountain Plains Minority Supplier Development Council, MPMSDC, based in Colorado. Again, we thank you for attending on today. We have some great information that we want to share, and we have a phenomenal guest. Steve Denny co-founded Innovative Business Advisors in 2018 and serves as a managing member of the firm. Steve has been actively engaged in MA activities in a wide variety of industries for the last 14 years and has developed specific products to assist clients in growing their profitability and enterprise value. His specialty is working with established private companies in the lower middle market with annual revenues from $1 from $1 million to $50 million. Prior to founding his own firm in 2005, Stephen spent 25 years as a senior executive in the hospitality management business, working with two Fortune 25 companies. During this time, Stephen distinguished himself as an exceptional business development and leadership professional, perennially appointed as member of the Chairman Club. This led to his appointment to lead the formation of a common platform used to manage customer relationships globally. Today, Stephen is going to share with us information regarding PPP funding. He is very astute in this area and has helped many businesses. Please help me welcome Steve Denny, principal of IBA. Well, Marvin, thank you very much. I appreciate very much your introduction. Excellent. Well, good morning, folks. Great, beautiful morning. The sun is finally shining here in Missouri, where Marvin and I sit uh, this morning, and it's uh, good to see it after uh, after we've seen nothing but snow falling. So, Marvin, I'm going to switch over and share my screen here, and I'm hopeful that you can see that well. Yes, we can. Excellent. Very good. All right, folks, um, as Marvin had said, we're going to cover the Paycheck Protection Program now open again for the second time. Uh, so we're going to cover it in detail this morning. I'm delighted to take any of your questions and provide any uh, any level of clarification that may not be included in these slides. I'll also share with you that the slides are going to be available to you afterwards. So if you'd like a copy of those, just reach out to Marvin and his team and he'd be happy to happy to provide that information to you. So Paycheck Protection Program is now open. We're going to cover this morning some of the new guidance that's been issued uh, regarding the program. We're also going to talk a little bit about eligibility in the program and uh, how to determine whether or not your particular company would uh, be able to apply and be approved. Then we'll cover some of the set-asides that are established out there. There's some really uh, really interesting and encouraging set-asides. And then uh, we'll also dive into some of the forgiveness aspects of the program as well, because many of those things have changed also. So um, with that, uh, that'll be our agenda for this morning. And let me dive right in and begin with the new guidance. So the, the most significant thing that happened is that the program reopened again for first time applicants. Uh, there were a lot of uh, a lot of applicants in the first round, which um, which ended um, last summer, and there was obviously a lot of discussion in various industry associations about whether people should take advantage of the Paycheck Protection Program or not. So, I think that uh, having that kind of fall cooling off period where the money ran out and nobody could uh, take advantage of it. Uh, proved to be uh, somewhat uh, illuminating and Congress in its infinite wisdom reauthorized the program and uh, and brought it back uh, when it was signed into law on December 27th. The really nice thing about it is if you 
were an applicant that took advantage of the Paycheck Protection Program the first time around. And um, boy, you lived through an interesting time as we were uh, as we were on air every week providing new guidance uh, that was coming out of Washington regarding the rules and regulations that were promulgated around the program. You know, it was a little bit of a of a roller coaster ride. Some some weeks we had good news to share. Some weeks we had bad news to share. The really good news of the new program is that it gives companies the opportunity to get a second draw. And that can be very, very helpful if you were one of the many businesses that were severely affected in being deemed non-essential and forced to close, or in the hospitality industry, you may have been forced to close. And then when you were allowed to begin to reopen, you were only allowed to reopen in a, in a very, uh, very small and, and staged uh, process. So you know, there was, there was certainly a lot of pain throughout the, throughout the country in this regard. So this new second draw eligibility, you know, if the first draw kept the, your business afloat and it would enabled you to get through the, the fall, hopefully this second draw will enable you to basically re-equip here in the winter and early spring and be in a position where uh, as hopefully as as we return to some semblance of normal life that, that your business will be able to recover as well. So that's a key new provision uh, of the of the Paycheck Protection Program. Another significant enhancement to the program is that Congress also authorized four new allowable expense categories. So just in overview, the program as a whole provided that um, you could borrow money to cover the, cover the paycheck uh, needs of your employees. And the uniqueness of the Paycheck Protection Program is that if you use the funds as they were designed to be used, meaning that at least 60% 60, 60 of the funds or six out of every $10 that you got was used to cover your payroll cost, then you could also use the other 40% to cover other expense categories. But in the past, they were very, very limited in essence to just rent and utilities. Now Congress has expanded that to four new expense categories. And I'll cover those in detail because it's, uh, it really is providing a pretty significant level of relief. The next, key thing that uh, is a part of this new law, what's referred to as the Economic Aid Act, reauthorizing the Paycheck Protection Program, is a new forgiveness process. Uh, and this is really significant. Over 80% of the original loans were for amounts of less than $150,000. And really what they did with the new forgiveness process is that if you were a borrower that received a PPP loan of $150,000 or less, basically they simplified the forgiveness process whereby you just make a um, a application very much like your loan application very very simple one page you just put in a few numbers and check a bunch of boxes attesting that you use the funds that as they were described to be used and then you uh, sign and certify the forgiveness application and you send it in with no attachments so it was a significant improvement to the process and we'll cover that in detail and then finally, they made some significant revisions to the tax consequences as well. So uh, this is a forgivable loan, uh, very unique. I'm not sure that Congress has done a lot of this in the past, certainly the first time in my lifetime that I can, that I'm aware of in that regard. But, um, you know, there in the past, those things have been followed by these lovely little documents called 1099 miscellaneous, which, uh, you had to report as additional income, but Congress has revised that and we'll talk about that as well. So let me dive in specifically to the eligibility and uh, Marvin, if uh, any questions come in, I'd be happy to either take those during the presentation or at, uh, at a specific time, if you'll just, you'll just interrupt me and let me know when it's appropriate to answer a question in that regard. You got it. Very good. All right, so program eligibility. The, um, 
one thing here, see if I can get my computer to cooperate with me. Doesn't, here we go. First and foremost, the program is only open for a short period of time. Uh, and it's designed to be open until March 31st of this year or until the funds run out. Uh, we got an update um, earlier in, well, I guess it was actually last Friday. We got an update on uh, what the funding was and funding is about halfway dispersed. So, you know, I think there's a chance that funding will last until March 31st, but if you're contemplating applying for a PPP loan, I would strongly encourage you to get in line now, get your application in. You can always um, elect to not take the funds when they're offered to you, but it, it's, you know, it'd be more of a, more of a tragedy if you needed the funds and waited till the last minute to apply and the funds had run out. So I strongly encourage you to, uh, to apply and at least have the option of whether or not you're going to, you're going to use the funding. So a significant change now is that um, in the past, all companies were only eligible for for PPP total loan amount that was equal to two and a half months of your payroll cost. Now, if you're in the hospitality, food service and accommodations, um, national industrial classification index. So if you're a business that operates in the accommodation or food services business, you have a special provision which allows you to apply for up to three and a half months of the payroll cost of your company. So this is a, this is a nice expansion of uh, loan funds that are available to businesses that were deemed to be extremely hard hit throughout this pandemic. The second big thing is that you can, again, if you didn't apply before, you can now apply for a first draw, what they call the first draw PPP loan, which enables you to get your first loan. And if you already had a first loan and have already used those funds, then you can also apply for what's called the second draw. And um, there's a special qualification there. And in, old, in order to be eligible for the second draw, your, your qualification is you must have exhausted the original loan proceeds. Now, please bear in mind, this means that you just have to have used the money. You do not have to have applied for and received forgiveness yet. You only have to have used the money and basically be, you know, be out of the money and, need, and in need of a second draw in that regard. So a really nice way to help those businesses that are really most in need of help. Another significant change to the eligibility requirements is that they set aside um, these type of funds specifically for companies that had 300 employees or less. So if you'll remember, the original PPP loan guidelines were for all small businesses up to 500 employees. Now what they've said for the second draw loans is they're only going to, they're going to reserve those funds for basically the smallest of the small businesses, those with 300 employees or less. Uh, so I think, again, you know, those that seem to have suffered the most, um, Congress is, is making sp some special provisions out there. Now, one of the things you do have to certify is that you had a 25% or more drop in your gross receipts or your gross income of your business in any quarter when you compare 2020 to 2019. So 2019 was basically the, the normal year. 2020 was primarily the pandemic year. And it's not annual drop in revenue. It's a quarter by quarter comparison. So uh, we had clients that may have ended up 2020 where overall their overall drop in revenue. I had one client, for example, their overall drop in revenue was about 12%, but they had one quarter um, where they had a significant greater than 30% drop in revenue. So a uh, significant drop in revenue in one quarter, but then they had a, a strong rebound once they were able to reopen, which which was nice. But it's but bear in mind, it's not the 
Um, it's not an annual comparison. I just want to emphasize this because there was a lot of confusion in this area. It is a quarter by quarter comparison. So what you have to identify on your application is specifically which quarter and um, they're the application is assuming calendar quarters, so it'd be quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. Which quarter, comparing revenues of 2020 to 2019, did you have a revenue drop of 25% or more? The other key thing that I'll point out here is that um, SBA is very specific about this. So if you show up with a 24.9% revenue drop, you do not qualify. You must have a 25% or greater revenue drop in order to qualify. Another big change is $2 million maximum loan amounts. Uh, you know, the, the original PPP loan amount allowed for a much larger amount, but in this second draw, they're only allowing companies to take up to a $2 million loan. But remember, over 80% of all loans were in an amount of less than 150,000. So I don't think that for most uh, most Main Street and, and, and you know, regular town businesses, this is not gonna be uh, much of a limiting factor. There were some um, reduction in salary and headcount rules and those still apply. And they uh, what they did is they called, if you had no change or you had changes that were not precipitated by the business owner. You may have had an employee, for example, that you had asked to come back to work and the employee for you know, a whole variety of reasons elected not to come back to work, then the employer was not, uh, was not held responsible or not, not penalized if that employee didn't return to work. They called those safe harbor time periods and all of those have been extended as well. So um, if you have a reduction in salary for your team or a reduction in headcount for your team, there are some specific provisions that apply, but again, they, they've extended those safe harbor time periods as well. Um, another, another interesting uh, expansion is that they have also broadened out the type of companies that can apply for this. And that now applies to 501c6, uh, basically, you know, nonprofit type of organizations, housing co-ops, and then all radio and TV entities are now eligible for this program as well. And I guess Congress saw that there was a little bit of an oversight in, uh, in originally not including those businesses in the original program. So they fixed that in, uh, in this new law. So let's talk about some of the new provisions. And this is one of the areas that uh, can be really beneficial. First and foremost, as I had stated before, there are four new expense categories and you can use up to 40% of the loan for these categories. So remember the whole PPP program, PPP being an acronym for Paycheck Protection Program, um, the federal government in its, um, in its discretion had determined that these loans were to be used to keep people at work as much as possible and that the fastest way to get aid into the hands of those that needed it most was you know, through, uh, through their employers. So it turned out to be a pretty effective way of doing so and it helps the states by keeping people off of the unemployment rolls. But, you know, originally they said you had to use up to 80% of the proceeds for the payroll and they kept dialing that back. So now you have to use 60% for payroll, 40% for these other categories, but they've now ex dramatically expanded these other categories. So the first is what, um, what they now call covered supplier cost. So what does this mean? The simple description would be direct cost or cost of goods sold items. So this is basically for anything that you have to buy to fulfill the requirements of serving your customer. So if you're a restaurant and you've got to buy fresh, fresh food and fresh produce and fresh meat and fresh dairy, et cetera, that is considered a covered supplier cost. So now you can use whatever, whatever material costs you have in order to fulfill the 
product or service needs of your company, um, those are now included as reimbursable or actually uh, forgivable uses of the loan proceeds, if you will. That's a pretty, pretty substantial expansion. The next thing they covered was what uh, they refer to as covered operations expenditures. These are generally software costs, such as your QuickBooks costs, your ADP cost, any type of software program that you've got to use to run your business. Those costs are now eligible to be uh, funded by your PPP loan proceeds, which again is a pretty significant expansion. The other big thing is covered worker protection expenditures. So this would be for PPE, any mass, any of the Lucite panels you might have had to put up into your business, any special signage that you may have had to put into your business to uh, highlight that customers need to walk down an aisle one way and a different aisle a different way. So any specific um, worker protection expenditures that were necessary for you to uh, to put into your business in order to make sure that you were honoring uh, social distancing and other CDC guidelines. Now all of those expenses can also be covered under this loan. Another pretty, pretty uh, expansive use of the money, if you will. And then finally, uh, for those that were in areas where there was uh, civil unrest, They've provided a provision here that allows you to put your covered property damage expenditures, anything outside of whatever your insurance might have covered. So uh, you can't double dip if you had some insurance proceeds in that. But if you did have damage to your business, um, you can utilize uh, PPP funds to cover those as well. Another significant uh, expansion is that they have now said that payroll costs, and remember payroll costs are 60% of what you need to use the funds for. Now you can include the employer portion of the group health insurance in that payroll cost calculation as well. So just another way for businesses to be able to uh, allocate um, their actual operating expenses into the, the PPP loan, um, loan provisions. So pretty, pretty, pretty expansive use of the funds that are now available for borrowers that are either taking their first draw of the PPP or those that are now taking a second draw of the PPP. Let me move specifically to a couple of set-asides, and this is really, really important. Um, and um, so I'm going to talk about two special cases here and then how to take advantage of that. First and foremost, if you are a business with less than 10 employees, there's a special set aside available for community lenders to be able to um, have a special pool of money that is allocated specifically for the smallest of, of small employee or employers, if you will. So if, you, if that happens to describe your company, you're in great shape. Um, you, I, you, you've got a little bit more room, if you will, than uh, for regular program applicants. The other thing is if your business is located in low income areas, again, Congress has set aside a special pool of funds specifically for businesses in those areas. And uh, they're really trying to make sure that folks in those low income areas and the smallest of companies have the ability to take advantage of these programs. So. One of the things they did is they provided a, uh, a two-day head start. That time period has passed, but when they originally opened the application window, they, uh, they had a two-day head start for each of the various application windows, specifically for the small business. The, the real secret here is that really what you should do is focus, if you're looking for a PPP loan, focus on going to community lenders. So these are the, the credit unions, the local banks, the local community lenders. Um, the, the community lenders themselves have been given a special set aside of funds and encouraged to work specifically with small businesses of less than 10 employees located in low income areas. 
Uh, and this is in, this has been very, very successful. So we work with a couple of community lenders in the St. Louis area, and they have uh, they have really been busy. And we've done all we can to to help direct people their way as well. So strongly encourage you if you're if you haven't already taken advantage of PPP and you're considering it, I would strongly encourage you to go to a community lender particularly if you're a business with less than 10 employees and you might uh, have a business with an address that's located in a low income area. And this is significant folks. This is $15 billion that Congress has set aside. So there's a, there's a good pool of money there. And when I was looking at the um, uh, availability tables last week that uh, SBA supplied, there's, there's still pretty good, uh, pretty good, range of funds still available in those areas. So the secret there is really focus on going to the community lenders. I think what you'll find is that they're well equipped, they move very, very quickly, and usually within a day or two, you know exactly whether or not you're gonna be approved and for how much. And uh, typically, they disperse those loans within five days, so you get the money very, very quickly. So hopefully that, uh, that'll be a bit of a help there. Now, let me transition. We talked about all the various ways you can use the funds and the dramatic expansion that uh, Congress provided for the, for the use of those funds and how to, how to go tap those funds, uh, specifically with a focus on community lenders. Let's assume now that you've, uh, you've gotten the funds and you wanna, you wanna be given uh, forgiveness for those funds, i.e. you don't have to pay those funds back. So, Really, uh, really nice expansions that Congress has put in, and I'll cover those with you now. So first and foremost, the covered period. So what this means is this covered period is a particular term of the loan from the day you receive the money, from the day that the, the lender gives you the money, until the end of either eight weeks or 24 weeks thereafter, that's considered the covered period. So again, if you'll recall, if you're, let's say for example, that you're a restaurant and you're in a low income area and you've got uh, nine employees and your payroll um, is, um, um, you're eligible to receive funds that covers your payroll for those employees for three and a half months, right? So you can actually get funding for that and you'll get it very very quickly you'll then have enough money to cover your payroll for three and a half months but you'll actually have a full 24 weeks in in order to use that that money so you know your business as as your business is continuing to improve in revenue you might get to the period at some point where you're um, where you've got excess profits and you can begin to cover all of your payroll costs on your own again so it's nice for the borrower to be able to now choose whether or not you're going to use either an eight week or a 24 week period. But you got to remember that you have to use the funds within that covered period in order to be able to submit and receive forgiveness, meaning you don't have to pay the funds back. So the big significant change is that there's now this real simple application for forgiveness. So you got to make an application for the loan and it's literally, literally a one page application, fill in a few blanks and sign and request the loan. The, the simplified application for forgiveness on loans of less than 150,000 is now very, very similar. It's a single one page form with a very simple certification process. In effect, the, the the forgiveness form is really as easy as the application form. And this is a this is a really big change because prior to this change, the form was either a five or an 11 page form and uh, had some tables and, and lots of calculations in it and seemed to be relatively confusing. So this was a, a very, very big change. The, uh, the other key thing is that let's assume that you received a $100,000 loan for your business. You use the funds to cover payroll and some of these other covered expenses. And then you applied for forgiveness for the whole $100,000 and you were forgiven that whole $100,000 loan. 
In the past, you might have received a 1099 MISC miscellaneous income form, which required you to, to um, tell the IRS that you had received this gift of 100,000 from your Uncle Sam, which the IRS was then going to tax for you. Now Congress has changed that and said that forgiven loan proceeds will not be recorded as income. So that's a huge change. And unfortunately, Congress didn't do this until December 27th, um, which meant that some banks did issue 1099s uh, to borrowers that had already been through the forgiveness process. Now the, the, now the, the banks and the SBA are going back and cleaning all that up. So they're now going back and reissuing new 1099s that have been adjusted that say there is zero, uh, zero income. And um, obviously they're having to change the, the loan proceeds uh, and the use of funds and so forth. So, um, you know, all in all, everything benefits the borrower in this regard. So nothing really to be too concerned about. So the other thing, the other huge change is that in the original CARES Act, they said that if you received PPP funds, and even if you were forgiven repayment of those funds, so let's assume you got a $100,000 loan, you used it as prescribed, and they forgave uh, the repayment of that, so you didn't have to pay it back. But one of the things the original law said was you could not deduct those expenses that you use the funds to cover on your tax returns. Well, Congress changed that. And now they said the PPP loan is tax neutral. So not only will you not get a 1099 for the income that was forgiven, but you also can use the expenses on your tax returns that those PPP funds covered. So that's a huge change that really made not only did it make it tax neutral, it probably made it tax advantaged for the business owner in that regard. So big change. So big thing is what do you do now, right? And what we say is be prepared to act, always be in this position. So what does that mean? You should always be current on your business operating reports, your, your profit and loss reports, your balance sheets, your cash flow statements. You should always be current on those things. Also, be current on your business tax filings, particularly if you're, if you're doing extensions, if you're not in a position where you can uh, meet the deadlines or your, your accountant may be recommending that you do extensions, just be current on making sure you have all the right forms in play. And then, you know, you need to sit down and do a comparison, particularly quarter over quarter comparison of your 2019 performance to your 2020 performance. And um, it's, it's quite revealing when you do that. We had many of our clients that were quite surprised that they saw, you know, how badly they went down in a, in a particular quarter, but they may have bounced back up in many of the other ones. So, you know, you need to sit down and do that so that you're informed and know whether or not you meet that 25% reduction um, qualification requirement. And if you do, then you are free to apply and, uh, and you will definitely be granted, uh, granted loans in those regards. And then finally, I would say to you, community banks are given preference. So, you know, this is, uh, this is an opportunity for you, even if you don't have a relationship with a community bank, even if you are not one of their customers, if you're dealing, your day-to-day -day bank is one of the big national or regional banks like Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, you know, Wells Fargo, Regions, et cetera, um, I would strongly encourage you to go make a relationship with a community bank. They're given preference in this process right now, which can help speed the process for you and make sure that the funds are available for you as well. So uh, those are the things that we would recommend now. Um, and um, I would also call out that we've got several upcoming webinars that we, that we lead on our channel and um, happy to describe uh, um, any, uh, any of the additional changes in programs, we'll bring those every week into our channel. And here's where you can find us. So we've got lots of resources that are available for you. You can go directly to our website, which is www 
www.innovativeba.com. You can also find us at you don't know what you don't know.com and request a copy of one of the one of the books that uh, we've written for business owners or you can find us in all the all the primary social media channels. So Marvin with that I'm going to turn the lectern back over to you and see if we have any questions and hopefully this was an informative webinar for your audience. Wow, I mean this is uh this is phenomenal information. I mean you've shared several things that I didn't know and as we look at the work of the Congress, I mean, it, it, it seems like for the first time in a long time, at least from my perspective, that Congress actually listened <laughs> to the people and uh, to the small business owners to see what the problems were and how to, de to, how to develop solutions that could really reach uh, Main Street, as it's so often said. So uh, just great information. I see there's one question in the chat. It says, are 1099 are 1099s eligible for the second round of PPP? Um, yes. So if you are a 1099 contractor, yes, you are eligible. Yeah, we know there was a lot of uh, confusion in the first round with regards to that because you have a lot of uh, sole proprietors, self-employed fo folks or what have you. Um, and, and it took a while to get really get uh, uh, for lenders to get their hands around that as new rules were passed down or new information was passed down to get that clarified. We have another question from Leela. I'm going to unmute your mic, Leela. All right, you're unmuted. Well, maybe not. One, let me try again. Good morning. There you Good go. morning. Hello. OK, I have a question for you because I applied the, I applied to pay PP in the first time and I did qualify for it and they did give me the, the money and all that stuff. But I don't lie to you because uh, with uh, these things is it's like it's my first language. I'm trying to go for it. And I did succeed actually to get the PPP in the first time, but I did not know we can go ahead and apply for the forgiveness right away. I thought after that they will send us a paper my question uh where to go to to find that form to start to get going with it or it's uh, or my chance is gone so you, remember your chance is not gone you you can apply for forgiveness up until the end of the loan period right so you got plenty of time in order to do that but where, where to get the form most specifically, go to sba.gov and there's a, there's a search window up there and just type in PPP forgiveness application form. You're going to see that there's three of them. There's what they call the 3508, the 3508S, and the 3508EZ. Um, depending upon the size of your loan is is determining which form you're going to need to use. If your loan was for less than 150,000, you yes. will use the uh, 3508S form, which is the one page form. Oh, you're the best. Thank you. Actually, no, really, I was just getting nervous as to when it's coming, when it's coming. But yeah. thank you. Appreciate your time. No problem. You're very welcome. Well, Steve, you, you talked about, you know, working with uh, community lenders specifically for those, uh, entities that are looking that that have less than 10 employees or they're located in a low income area how important is it for those companies to reach out now uh, to those community lenders or even some of the partners that we've listed uh, in the chat as well yeah i think uh, i think marvin it's very important and i think it's um it's the it's a unique situation so i want to go back to a comment just before that last caller came on so um we've been saying this for a long time and i think it's important for your audience to be aware of this this was all 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 that congress did last year was brand new it had never been done before so you know Congress and the administration and their infinite wisdom created these programs. They charged uh, the SBA and all the various lenders 
to go out and administer these programs. The banks had never done this before, right? The borrowers had never done this before. It was all new to everybody. So there was a lot of, you know, a lot of, of uh, clarifications and rule changes and different things that happened throughout the year. And it was, it was, it was really kind of a seesaw year last year in that regard. What, what I invite your audience to do is just remember, give them a little grace because just like the borrowers, you know, the lenders and all of the government authorities, everybody was in brand new territory. There was no precedent for this. It had never been done before. So, you know, I give them a lot of grace. What they accomplished, I think, was uh, unbelievable. Uh, never, never before have has the SBA done so much. They literally did 30 years worth of work in eight <laughs> months. Yeah. Right. They literally did that. It was absolutely astounding what what was accomplished. But in this again, in this particular situation, Congress has advantaged the community lenders. So even if you don't have a relationship with them, if you've never even met them, go out and knock on their door and, you know, as a business owner, start a relationship with the community bank. You do not have to be a, a customer of theirs to use them as the lender for the PPP program. Got you, got you. Well, th this has been great information. And so I want to touch on one other thing real quick, um, mm -hmm. because we know that a lot of businesses have had to pivot um, and, and maybe not in the way of keeping their business, but in looking to sell their business. And so we know that one of the things that um, IBA does and the work that you do there is that you help firms uh, evaluate their businesses uh, for sale. And and can you talk a little bit about how um, how companies have pivoted in that respect and how you've been able to assist those companies uh, during uh, this uh, during the pandemic? Yeah, it's been a it's been a challenging year. And again, it's unprecedented. So, you know, our country's never faced anything like this for more than 100 years. And back then, you know, uh, basically selling your business wasn't wasn't nearly as prevalent as it is today. So, um, so typically businesses trade based on the on the fair market value of their company, right? And that that value is built up over time. Well, what's happened obviously is the pandemic has made it you know made it challenging for some businesses, and frankly, some businesses have really prospered during this period as well. Right. So so we've seen kind of both ends of the spectrum. We've seen businesses that have done really, really well, and we've seen businesses that have really, really suffered. But by and large, what we have said is, um, you know, do everything you can to stay alive because the you know, our economy, our economy will um, will recover. And we have done a tremendous amount of valuation work over the past year. We go in and help companies value what's going on in their business. And one of the things that we try and do, Marvin, is determine, is this a one-time non-recurring event? So a pandemic definitely is, right? But um, if, the, if the damage is not fatal to the company, then, you know, we can basically factor that out and say, you know, what what does what does normal really look like for this business? And in that situation, is um, you know this business is a compelling value in a in kind of a normal time. There been there have been a lot of businesses that have turned over. The overall level of of um, of uh, mergers and acquisition activity for small businesses is off by almost fifty percent over the last year, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, but what I would tell you is the businesses that have done really, really well, there are a lot of buyers in the market right now. And if you're, you know, if you're contemplating getting out of your business, um, the values have held up pretty well. So there's been a little bit of a, in certain industries, there's been a little bit of a downtick in values, but generally the values of, uh, of businesses have held up well. So there's a lot of buyers chasing really good businesses right now. And it's a, it's, it's a good time to be a seller. Awesome. So hopefully that answers your question. It, it, it does. It does. And I want to make sure that our, our audience knows of, of the great work that you do. And I know we, we haven't covered everything because uh, uh, innovative uh, business advisors uh, really 
from from my experience in meeting you, you all do a great job of taking a good look, a holistic look at a small business or at a business and determining, you know, what the what the best options are. And so I appreciate that about your your company and about you and wanted to make sure that we're exposing uh, our audience to uh, all of the options or as many options as we can to help them through the pandemic. Well, awesome. That's our aim as well, Marvin. So my hat's off to you, man. It's it's uh, it's been great work this year, and it's uh, we're not out of the woods yet, but seems like uh, seems like we can see the end of the trail. Absolutely, absolutely. And 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 the information you've shared today has been extremely valuable. Uh, again, we will share more. Looks like we have a question from Marjorie Williams with the Denver Minority Business Development Agency. Uh, go ahead, Marjorie. I think. Sure. Yeah, good morning. And I'm sorry I missed the first part because I, I didn't realize it was it was the time frame. But I had a question in regards to the number of employees that a person has at the time that they uh, actually do the PPP loan. If those employees that they had, for instance, they had they had 20 and then now they have they only have five. Does that not affect the forgiveness uh, amount that, that that is forgiven? If, if those numbers of employees are are less than when they originally got the loan itself, those are some of the issues that um, my clients were having. Marjorie, it 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 does, but the big answer is it depends, Marjorie. So, for example, if um, let's say you had twenty and and now you have ten, right? But the 10 employees that you lost were not laid off, but what happened was they may have had to, you know, leave their place of employment to take care of a family member, or they may have gotten sick themselves and, and are on an extended recuperation, right? And, or if the employer did lay them off, but then recall, tried to recall them, called them back and said, look, business is recovering. We want you to come back to work. And the employee said, no, you know, I've got, I, I, I'm not going to come back to work in your location. In many of those situations where it's not necessarily the fault of the employer, then the employer is not penalized. Does that make sense? So there's, a, there are a lot of special circumstances. You have to really look at each case individually and, and determine what's going on there. Okay, and, and another question I had, you, you're saying, uh, the, you're talking about the uh, community, you know, the, the community banks, whatever, those are the ones that are, are you know, they're doing those. Are you, are you, you say community, are you just meaning in the community, or are you saying, saying it's, a, it's CDFIs only? Well, CBFIs have got a special set aside. Um, okay. But there, but you could go to any lender. It's just um, you know the community, the the local community banks uh, are the ones that are really advantaged in this scenario. So um, so you know we just highly recommend that, uh, particularly if you're one of the smaller employees of less than ten employees, mm -hmm. or you're located in a low income area. Mm -hmm. uh, in those special situations, you've you've got an advantage to go to a community bank. So, so are you saying, uh, uh, in other words, like a um, like a credit union as opposed to big bank? Yes, ma'am. A credit union, or <laughs> okay. you know, b bank of any town USA, rather than going to a Bank of America, if you will. Yeah. So if it's a if it's a bank that only has one or two branches, that is mm -hmm. that is a authorized lender under the PPP program. Yeah, mm -hmm. the local community banks are are where uh, where you definitely want to want to apply. Okay, one one other question, and I'll be done. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Happy to help. Now, the the fact that they use your 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 financials, you know, they're using your financials as 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 trying to to get the loan itself because of COVID, the the year of COVID. You know, your financials maybe for you know 2020, 2020 is not looking as good. You know, in 2019, be, due to COVID, are they going? Are they doing any special? Um, I mean, do they take that into consideration? You understand oh, yeah. what I said? Because you know, your financials may have really suffered. You know, that's why well, that's why you need loan. So right. I'm just wondering, you know, as they look at those financials, they consider those last three years, 
are they taking that into consideration? So first off, that's that's the key thing here, Marjorie. First off, is they're not looking at your at your complete financials, right? Mm -hmm. The only information you have to provide generally is sales revenue. Okay. And if your sales revenue is off by more than 25%, you automatically apply, you're automatically qualified. So yeah. you don't, you don't have to show them your full P and L's. You just got to show them, mm -hmm. you know, what's, how, how have you been affected by this? So, uh, so you're absolutely right. And, you know, business owners that are, you know, waiting until their accountants can give them the numbers mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. I mean, if they can look at their bank statements and see that their business is off by 25% or more in any particular quarter, go ahead and make the application because you don't uh, have to submit a bunch of financial reports with the application. Yeah, because what, what was some of the issues they were having with some of the larger banks, even though I hear what, I hear what you're saying, but they were still... Uh, nationally you know looking at it and and they were somewhat uh they felt they were let me put it this way they felt they were somewhat being uh denied because of it because they were asking for a, a little more than what uh ppp loan requirements wanted you know that, yeah you're you're exactly right and that's and you know the the what happened was again, as as we had talked about earlier, this was a brand new program. Banks mm -hmm. didn't know how to deal with it either. So a it bank, sure if didn't. you think about a bank, they're coming at it thinking about they're going to go through their regular underwriting process. But mm -hmm. but Congress and the law said no, you don't have to do that. All you have to do is take the representation from the borrower. Period. You don't have to take anything else. So forget about your normal underwriting process. Mm -hmm. You just get the information and put it into the SBA portal. You know, the SBA website that only the banks have access to. Mm -hmm. All they all they were asking the banks to do is just go get this okay. information from your clients and put it in and let us make the decision. You don't have to worry about it. So, you know, Steve, no, sorry, Marjorie. No, Steve, I'm that, saying, so another, uh, go ahead, Marjorie. I'm sorry. One last step. So in other words, it behooves us as we as I as I talk with my clients that they know what you're saying in this in this uh, uh, webinar here, that they know what their rights are as far as to the 25% and those kind of things. And I, I think if, if they're, if they keep themselves informed and, and they know this, then they, they can't be caught up. You know, some of them just do it anyway. You understand what I'm saying? So Amen, Marjorie. And the really, other, you know, the knowledge other... is, is, is power. And so I really appreciate, um, you know, the, what I did here and from my, and, and the things that you're doing because, they need to know what the what these rules and regulations are when they apply. Thank you. Marjorie, one other quick comment. Um, be sure you can tell your clients that if they go to any bank, I don't care whether it's a community bank or, you know, or the largest bank in the country, mm -hmm. right? And they don't feel like they're treated well, mm -hmm. they they are not prohibited from applying at other banks. So I encourage yes. applicants to go apply at multiple banks and whoever approves them first gets the loan. Now they can't mm -hmm. take out more than one loan. That would be fraud. But you know, if, if I were, if I were a business that was in one of these areas and I were hurting, and even if I didn't have complete records available to show them, I would go and apply at multiple sure. banks and, mm -hmm. um, and whoever, you know, gives them the yes first is the one that I would talk with about closing the loan. All right. Wow. Thank you. Steve, Steve, that's, that's phenomenal. So, so, so two things I wanted to touch on real quick. So one, that last point you just made, I don't think I've, I, this is the first time that I've heard uh, business owners uh, be told to apply at more than one bank. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very glad. Absolutely. That that. Oh yeah. Um, that That's phenomenal. Uh, the now second. remind them, remind them they can't take more than one loan, but they can apply. They could apply at every bank in town. Got yeah. you, got you. And you had made a point. Uh, you you were talking about the banks and the underwriting process. Interesting enough, I talked to um, uh, one one of my one of my bankers uh, a couple of days ago, and um, she she manages a uh, well. She's over the the lending. Uh, SBA lending for one of the uh, one of a small local banks here in our area, mm -hmm. and the bank opted out because they did not they were afraid of not using their regular underwriting practices and how that could potentially mm -hmm. affect them down the road. And so it, it, they just didn't have the trust 
I guess, in in in, in, in the new rules or what have you, or in this process, and uh, and so they opted out of uh, uh, of participating in the second round of uh, PPP funds funding. Yeah, Marvin, I've I've heard of that a lot, um, and and listen, you know. Putting, thinking about the banker's perspective for a minute, they're usually very conservative people, so mm -hmm. I don't begrudge them about that at right. all. But that, but remember, they're not the only bank in town. So the biggest thing is, you know, if your audience goes to their regular banker and that regular banker has that weariness of mm -hmm. not, you know, of not being up to speed with these new rules and new programs, mm -hmm. and doesn't know whether they can do it right. Tell your tell your clients don't be afraid to go to the bank next door to somebody you don't know and apply, because they may you know there are a lot of banks that are doing their best to stay up with all the latest changes on these programs and make sure that they can serve their customers as quickly as possible. Thank you. Well, Stephen, I, I don't want to belabor the hour. Uh, we we go up, we're going up against our time here, and we thank you for. Uh, getting up this cold, blistery morning in Missouri. Uh, you're on the opposite side of the state here that I'm in, uh, but you know there is a, there's love between Kansas City and St. Louis. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and so we want to thank you again, uh, Stephen, and uh, for sharing this information uh, with our audience. We know that it will be helpful for those who are wanting to uh, pursue uh, PPP funding. Uh, we encourage you to use every resource that is available to you at this time and to uh, make sure that you stay in tune, not only with the council, I'm sorry, not only with the CARES Act Assistance Program, but stay in tune with uh, innovative business advisors. Uh, the information is up on the screen. We hope that you will tune in to some of the other workshops and webinars. Uh, that Steve and his uh, team conducts. Uh, we also hope to have Steve back uh, with us on the, with the CARES Act Assistance Program as well. So with that said, we thank you all. We thank all of our special guests. We thank you so much for tuning in today and be sure to look out uh, to check your email as we will send you uh, this video. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marvin. Thank you, Marvin. Sleep. One night on the road, and we are a chiropractor. You know.